So this sure. is the name. <clears throat> this is the name of the project that was approved, authorized by Dirección General de Investigación y Postgrado last year in January. And we even we even got some budget uh, last year and this year. We spent the whole budget last year, but this year for due to the pandemia, uh, we haven't used the budget. So basically, uh, we're giving it back, right? Because we're not allowed to attend conferences or congresses physically. We we can only attend uh, these events if they are conducted through internet. So this uh, this is the name of our of our research topic. Errores Sintácticos y Semánticos en la Escritura Académica de Aprendices de Habla Hispana. We didn't change this because this is the name that was registered in postgrado. So that's, that's what we keep. We usually change the name. We have changed the name for the different presentations that we had given in the past, right? And so I'm responsible for this project. And then Dr. Stewart, he's been collaborating in this project since the beginning and even before the beginning. And then uh, early this year, we contacted Dr. Silvia Rodriguez. She is a doctor in Departamento de Estadística. And she helped us out with the statistical analysis for some correlations that we did uh, with some of our variables, right? Next slide, please. So these are the four objectives uh, as they are stated in the project in Spanish. Uh, we, we have to write the project in Spanish, obviously. And basically we have fulfilled the three first objectives. And now what we're doing is uh, we're trying to comply with the last objective, which is this, what, what we're doing. We just gave a talk to actually a workshop workshop talk to seven semester students like three weeks ago. We asked teacher Tonio to allow us to be in his class, in his uh, writing academic English class. And we gave this presentation to these students. Yesterday, we also asked uh, teacher Lolis to allow us to give the, the presentation to the fifth semester students. And today, we just send the invitation, we send the invite for the teachers, for those who would be interested in knowing about what we did in this uh, study, right? Now uh, you take over, Benjamin. Yeah, I think it's important also to mention at uh, this time, the, the main problem that we're after. You know, we teach in the, the BA and we've seen, we've taught a lot of different level uh, students helping them develop their writing skill. And uh, we know that writing is uh, the most difficult skill to develop. And so one of the purposes for this study is to hopefully provide some insight to all teachers within the BA in terms of how we as teachers look at how we provide feedback back to the students and, and try to find the most effective and efficient ways in, in doing so, so that we can work together collectively uh, within the academy to really help students develop their writing skill throughout the BA. So this provides a graphic, uh, graphical way of looking at what we're, what we wanted to get out of this research project. We have on one side, the writing development where today we're going to share with you some findings related to accuracy, complexity, and fluency. And we're also going to see how uh, the very specific types of errors, syntactical errors, morphological errors, and lexical errors uh, factor in to our, our results. We wanna bring all of that together and also link that to, uh, to uh, profiles of the students, the histories that students have uh, with the English language and to come up with any correlations that relate to that. So to provide a little bit of uh, theoretical uh, back, uh, background of uh, the theory behind what we're looking at, a lot of the studies look at analyzing uh, syntactic errors and semantic errors. And those studies are very valuable in that they look at, descriptively speaking, the very specific types of errors that students make from different cultures. 
And this is very useful in comparing and seeing some of the commonalities between the errors across cultures, as well as specific errors that differ uh, between cultures. But as we got into the literature and started digging deeper, we decided to look at the types of errors globally in terms of semantic errors, right? So we have an umbrella of semantics, and within that umbrella, we have three types of errors that we wanted to focus on, syntactic, morphological, and lexical. Again, these three categories of errors are going to fall under an umbrella of semantics because we um, are uh, saying that these three types of errors all have an impact on, <clears throat> on meaning. So for the purposes of our study, we're looking at errors. We're not making a distinction between errors and mistakes. Uh, we're not looking into fossilization, for example. We're looking just at errors as being uh, the use of a linguistic error in a way that uh, in, in which a fluent or native speaker of the language regards as showing faculty or uh, incomplete learning. So basically an error for the purposes of our study is simply a non-standard use of the language. So if we look at the different classifications of errors, first being syntactic, we are looking at common examples as being missing words and sentence fragments, okay? So these are going to be errors of word order, errors resulting from the absence of certain constituents. Errors also in combining sentences, some examples being run-on sentences and comma splices. These would be examples of syntactic errors. Morphological errors would be uh, those related to plurals, the correct use of plurals of nouns, uh, subject verb agreement, number and agreement, the proper use of uh, uncountable and countable nouns. Uh, we also want to look at errors of verbal morphology in the sense of verb tense, subject verb agreement, as I mentioned, passive formation, errors in terms of determiners and articles, and also prepositions. These are all examples of different types of morphological errors um, in terms of uh, using the English language. Our third classification of errors, lexical errors. Uh, for our purposes, we're looking at simply two general categories of lexical errors. One being word choice, and the second being word form. All right, so here we're just simply making a a distinction between more serious errors that might interfere with the meaning of uh, the, the text versus other types of lexical errors that may not interfere with the meaning, but they might be considered non-standard. They might be considered awkward. All right, so basically those are the two general categories that fall under this classification, this lexical error classification. So now we think about accuracy. So we looked at the types of errors, the three types of errors, syntactical, morphological, and lexical errors. And those are all under the category of accuracy. But in addition to those types of errors, we're also looking at coming up with a ratio, looking at it numerically in terms of what accuracy is. And, and we'll look into the specifics here in a few minutes, what that is. But simply stating, accuracy is the ability to, to be free of errors while using the language to communicate in either writing uh, or in speech. Complexity, we'll also look at a ratio and a formula for uh, articulating uh, complexity. But complexity is the development of grammatical complexity is progressively more elaborate language and of greater variety uh, of syntactic patterning. Now here, uh, we'll look at uh, different types of sentences, different types of clauses, and we'll talk here explicitly what that means to write more complex in a given text. And fluency. Fluency is not a measure of how sophisticated or accurate the words or structures are, but a measure of the sheer number of words or structural units a writer is able to include in the writing within a particular period 
of time. So it's important to re remember that, especially when we're talking about affluency, that we are speaking about a number at a specific time. And our study is going to do just that. It's going to provide an idea about how many words students wrote uh, in their text, but in a given, in a particular time. All right, in uh, the literature, there is, uh, it's important to uh, mention T units. In fact, T units is going to be our unit of measure. Uh, since this is a quantitative study, we're looking at T units as being the, the main um, the main unit that we are using to analyze. So to understand T units, we need to understand first what a clause is. So a clause being any group of words that has a subject and a verb, we can think of it in terms of independent and dependent clauses. Dependent clauses generally falling under the categories of relative clauses, subordinating clauses, and nominative or noun clauses. A T unit then will be defined as an independent clause with any dependent clauses that are attached within the same sentence. All right, so to provide some examples, a simple sentence that has one independent clause will be counted as one T unit. A compound sentence that has two independent clauses will be counted or considered as being two T units. A complex sentence, one that has an, one independent clause and one dependent clause, that will be an example of a, uh, of a single T unit, one T unit. And a compound complex sentence with three total clauses, two independent and one dependent clause would be counted as two T units. So this was the method in which um, we looked at and analyzed our own study. And uh, again, this is coming from the literature. This is in fact, not anything new. T units have been around for a long time. And uh, there's a reason for it, because even in the current literature, uh, this unit of analysis is still very much used today. So now we'll transition into the study itself, the method section. OK, thank you. So the research. A research question for this study is what are the salient syntactic, morphological, and lexical errors encountered by second semester students of a BA in ELT in composition writing? Uh, can you move the slide, please? Our participants were 31 learners of the BA in ELT and 12 males and 19 females and the level of English proficiency according to uh, according to the curricula uh, that will be between B1 and B2 and the age 20.75 years uh, within the range of 19 to 25 years. It's important to mention also that all the participants signed a consent form they were not obligated to uh, to participate, and it was not part of their their grade. Uh, they were they volunteered, and they also signed a consent form giving us permission to not only uh, for them to participate, but also to share their results. And it's also important that at the beginning of the study, there we have like 35, 36 students, but then some of them dropped. Some of them stopped attending the semester, and we ended up with 31 participants. The method, uh, basically, we approached them in their classroom, and we told them that we showed them a picture of two persons hugging each other, and we asked them to write about friendship using the topic friendship, and for that, uh, we allowed them to have the whole class, the 50 minutes of the class. And we just assisted them in whatever questions they had for uh, if they were doing OK in the type of essay that they were writing, right? We were, we were there all the time supervising their writings, right? We also applied an online questionnaire uh, 
Uh, this is basically to get demographic information and from that uh, some linguistic profiles which we will discuss later on in this presentation. Uh, we have this part in Spanish because this uh, this is the help that we received from Dr. Silvia Rodriguez, and since she doesn't speak English, then obviously this had to be in Spanish because this was we gave this presentation to the seven semester students in Tonio's class in academic writing class on the fourth of. August, right? That's that's like three or four weeks, and Silvia had uh, a part, Silvia participated in that presentation. So here, basically, we're saying that uh, we used the Poisson model, which is a model to uh, run some correlations, uh, given that we have several independent variables and one dependent variable we consider that this model is the best one has the best fit to do this type of statistical analysis and from this and also from the the online questionnaire we want to show it in a, in a little moment from there we determine the uh, linguistic uh, listening profile the linguistic speaking profile and the linguistic uh, historical profile of the learners in order to run these correlations between the performance of the learners on the essay, the types of errors they committed, and uh, the independent variables that we're going to show in a little bit. The package or the program that, we that was used for this the statistical analysis was the software R core team version 2013. This is a, a free available uh, software or program that is available in internet, uh, but it's kind of tricky to handle this program. This doctor is an expert in managing this, this uh, software. So uh, we'll, we'll show you in a little moment uh, what we did, right? Just to add a little bit here to the participants or the way in which we chose the participants. Um, as we've mentioned that this is a survey study, it's a correlative study, but also very much a survey study. And we, and it's a quantitative study uh, completely. We wanted to see if there are any tendencies, any correlations or any associations with uh, certain backgrounds of students in terms of their English, their exposure to English. We didn't want to simply compare, let's say, prope students to non-prope students, for, for example. We wanted to, to be a little bit more individualized in the sense of looking at their linguistic histories and then see if there's any, uh, any correlations with regard to those independent variables from the survey to their outcomes or their dependent variables in terms of the errors or uh, the way in which they wrote the writing development. So this is the questionnaire that we ask our participants to complete. And we have uh, Q1, which means question one. That one is about gender. And then we have the following questions about uh, uh, how much they practice the English language outside of the class. And question two and three and four, for example, they related to the speaking profile. Uh, questions six and six and seven, if you move the, the slide, thank you. Those are related to the listening profile. And questions eight, nine, and 10, they are related to the historical profile. This is how we determine the profiles of the learners before uh, we decided to use this Poisson model for running correlations. All right, so when we analyzed the essays, we, we took their work, they wrote them typically on a piece of paper, and we analyzed their text 
in terms of accuracy, complexity, and fluency. Errors that uh, were related to punctuation and spelling were not considered with the exception of comma splices and run-on sentences. And uh, so it's important to mention that we weren't looking for every possible type of error. And um, again, we were excluding punctuation for the most part and spelling. So here, uh, it looks a little dark on my screen. Hopefully you can see this. This is a list of different types of errors that we considered. Um, we have nouns and pronouns. Uh, these are related to word form. Um, perhaps this is a little bit easier to see. This is broken down into the types. So beginning with morphological errors, we have a list of codes and the type of error. We have some examples of the error and the correction of error as it's in bold here as some examples. So you'll notice that some of these types of errors, for example, word form, WF, we have uh, listed very specific types of errors as it relates to word form. We're not saying that this is something useful or even recommended for, for teachers, but in the analysis, we thought it was important to provide this level um, uh, of uh, detail and to include that in our analysis, right? So we have different forms of word form, articles, of course, prepositions, and so on. And uh, these are some examples. We also have syntactic errors being word order, missing word, run-on sentence, comma splice, sentence fragments. We have some examples of what those errors might look like, as well as corrections. Finally, we have lexical errors. Uh, we have the code, the type of error, the, um, the examples of the error, and the corrections. Okay, so these are basically how we categorized, based on the literature, categorized the, the types of errors that we uh, included in our study. Okay, here it's important also to say that these are the actual errors examples taken from different essays of the participants right as you can see there are some very basic errors if you go back benjamin to the previous slide for morphological errors which is the the area where learners in general it doesn't matter if they're basic learners intermediate or advanced this is the type of errors that you get the most when you conduct a study like this so you can see very very basic errors that some of the learners, some of the participants had at that time, uh, because this was uh, last year in January, uh, had at that time uh, in the, during the study. So there are very basic errors about pronouns, about the conjugation of verbs, as you can see in the error examples or the sentence examples, where we're indicating the type of error and the correction the way it should be written right so it's amazing what you can find when when you are investigating a topic like this all right thank you benjamin can you continue sure sure so here we have basically an example of an essay or an essay an example uh, of one of the participants this is uh they wrote it they they had the freedom to write their essays on their own notebooks, on their own uh, page, whatever they wanted to use. And, and we asked them to write it uh, in, with pencil. Right? We didn't ask them to write the computer because we, didn't, we thought that uh, using this type of media, this type of uh, means uh, would might impede or, or would not be as beneficial as learners just writing with their own hands, right? In the next slide, you can see actually what we did. Benjamin, if you move, this is exactly what we did with every essay. This is this is confusing, obviously, because we used and reused the essays for the different types of analysis. So, on the left hand side, you can see, on the left margin, you can see that you you can see numbers. The first thing that we did was to number the lines so we would agree on what line and what error we were uh, focusing on and then uh, we we proceeded with accuracy and we underlined 
We try to identify every possible error in each line, in each paragraph. We underline that, and on top of that, we wrote the code that we determined to use for this analysis. And then after that, we use we use brackets to identify the T units. And after that, we use parentheses to identify the clauses. And we counted all the all the all the T units, and we counted all the clauses, and we counted all the types of errors. And then obviously we classified mm -hmm. the errors into whether they were morphological errors, lexical errors, or syntactic errors. We're going to show you an example right now in the next slide. I would like uh, to mention uh, also. Uh, yeah, I would like to mention also that each one of us checked each of the text individually and did uh, what what you're seeing here. We did this individually and then we got together and we compared notes and reached decisions where we had any differences between the errors so that we reached a consensus for each type of error that is included in our study, each, each uh, type of clause, every aspect, we reached a, a decision uh, collectively uh, once we completed the analysis. Yeah, when we did that, when we were checking and double checking that we were we were doing more or less the same thing, I think we had like 80% or a, a little bit more of coincidence in what we were doing. And the disagreements that we had, we just, we just reached a consensus on that, right? So here's just an example of one of the paragraphs of the essay that you just saw, you just saw before. And here you can see that every error is underlined and then we have the code on the top. For example, the first one means subject verb agreement. Uh, the second one means there's something, there's something with the word form of the noun. Uh, the following one is we're missing an article there, obviously here an indefinite article and so on and so on, right? So as you can see, we we detected several errors in each in each paragraph. In the following slide, we're going to show you an example of complexity, the, the analysis of complexity that we did. The first thing that we did was to identify the T units, to quantify the T units in each line, in each sentence, in each paragraph. And then after that, we also quantify the number of clauses, dependent clauses, well, independent and dependent clauses. And now if we put it all together, then you can see in the following slide, the T units and the number of clauses within each T unit, right? Next slide, please. All right, so presenting the results, the first thing we did was to determine the number of errors. We analyzed, we found a total of 901 errors going through the process that we just explained. And you'll see here a list from top to bottom, the most frequent types of errors down to the less frequent, along with the frequency for each and the percentage of the total errors in the third column. Notice also we have the category of error uh, in parentheses, L standing for lexical, M standing for morphological, S standing for syntactic errors. So here you can see at a glance the most common types of errors that were committed uh, during uh, this study. Here we have an analysis within the category of syntactic errors. Here you'll see in this pie chart different errors, the, the, the most being comma splice and missing word. This, these were uh, the most frequent type of syntactic errors, 43% versus 32% uh, cent, uh, respectively. We also had errors in sentence fragments, word order, and run on sentences to a lesser degree. The syntactic errors, and I'm sorry because my, there we go, I can move that. Um, we had a total of 222 syntactic errors, or 25% of the total errors were categorized as syntactic. Morphological errors, we had a total of 399 errors in this category, or 44% of the total errors were this, of this type. Here you see that we had more of an equal distribution of the different types of morphological errors. Word form, verb tense, articles, 
prepositions in agreement. Those were the, the errors that we found in this analysis. You'll notice here, like in the prior slide, we have the frequency next to the title of the type of error, as well as the percentage. This is the percentage of morphological errors within this category. And then we have lexical errors. Um, we had, uh, I think, 251. My slide's a little cut off there. Or it looks like 28% of the total errors were lexical, divided up into two categories. Again, word choice and wrong word. We made a diff uh, distinction between words that were uh, completely uh, wrong in the sense that it interfered with the meaning, right? Uh, that would be considered a wrong word. So a wrong word would interfere with meaning, whereas word choice would be maybe an awkward word, maybe a non-standard word, but it didn't interfere with uh, the meaning of the text. But even though we only have two types of errors, it still makes up a large part, about 28% of the total errors, uh, in in the analysis when you take into consideration both types of errors here. Now the T unit analysis. So here we have accuracy, complexity, and fluency. So I'll present first the formula, the way in which we calculated these ratios, and then the interpretation. So for accuracy, we consider the total number of errors, in this case 901 total errors, divided by the total T units of all of the essays. We came up with 0.87. So what does this mean? This means that there were 0.87 errors per T unit. All right, so if we were to compare this, let's say with a lower level, remember our participants are around a B1 to B2 level. If we were to look at maybe a students at an A1 level, we might see an accuracy of 1.3, 1.5. It would be higher. This would be uh, this would be relevant to the accuracy. So not only are we looking at individual types of errors in terms of accuracy, but we're also assigning a ratio to uh, to the accuracy of a text. We have a complexity ratio of 1.57. This is figured by uh, calculating the total clauses of all the clauses of all the text divided by the total T units. So here we have a ratio of 1.57. We could say there were 1.57 total clauses per T unit. All right, so here the proper use of a dependent clause is an indicator of text complexity. So as an example, if we were to look at a simple sentence, this would have a ratio of 1.00. Compound sentence would also have a ratio of 1.00. A complex sentence would have a ratio of 2. And a compound complex sentence would have a ratio of 1.5, To just to provide some examples of what, what those types of sentences, how they would be factored into this ratio. Finally, we have fluency. This was calculated by figuring the total number of words and dividing that by the total T units. So here we have simply an average of 11.85 words per T unit. All right, this is particularly relevant when we're looking at English language learners who are Spanish speakers, especially when we compare the L1 and L2 uh, typically, uh, in Spanish, sentences are longer in nature when compared to uh, sentences in English. So these ratios here uh, provide a little bit more context than simply looking at one of these without the other, right? So if we're looking at this, uh, for example, if we wanted to change this study and research them again, maybe... Uh, include them in another study, we could compare these ratios to see whether or not if any of these uh, were to change in addition to obviously the types of errors that they committed. But our argument here is that we are proposing that we not only consider accuracy as teachers, but also look at how to help learners develop the complexity of their text. Specifically, how do they use 
um, dependent clauses throughout the writing. Okay, Luis, would you like to cover the correlations? Yeah, thank you. So the other study that we, the other analysis that we did was related to correlations. In this case, again, we use this uh, model of Poisson regression. And here in this table, what you can see is the, the questions from the, the online questionnaire, questions one to nine, well, actually, we're missing one, no question 10, I think. And then, and then you have the total number of errors in one column and total number of syntactic errors in another column, total number of morphological errors, and finally, total number of lexical errors. Uh, what you can see here is the, uh, the index in the, in the first column for total number of errors. And, and that is indicated with a negative sign if the correlation was negative. There's nothing if the correlation was positive. In the following column, in the following column, you have the significant, the significant index or significant value. And the ones I have an asterisk, that means that those correlations are significant. Three asterisks means that it's very, very significant at the level of 0 0.001, uh, two asterisks is significant at the level of 0 0.001, and one asterisk is significant at the level of 0 0.05. Usually in, in social sciences and humanities, the significant level is set at 0 0.05. That is, uh, that means that there's a 90% chance that something that you find in, the, in your results, it is probable to happen. Something uh, larger than that, larger than 0 0.05, which means lower than 95%, that is not significant because probably that's due to chance, right? Uh, so basically we have uh, negative correlations and positive correlations for our variables, for ind our independent variables, which are the ones uh, in the questions and for the dependent variable, which is the performance of the learners mm -hmm. on the type of errors. In the following slide, we basically present uh, in a more explicit way. We present the questions in English, obviously, the way they are in the online questionnaire. And for example, in the first one, we have question two and then a minus sign. That means that that's a negative correlation, which means the more the, the participants did this type of activity, the less errors they had when they wrote in their essays, right? So that one, that one is significant at the level of 0 0.05. So that one influenced in, in the less number of errors that they had uh, with, this specific, with, in, in, with this specific factor. Question three has a positive sign, which means uh, uh, it doesn't really matter how much they, they, they did this activity. This didn't really help them to uh, have less errors in, in their essays. However, uh, question two and three, those are the questions that helps to determine the, uh, the, speaking, the speaking profile of the learners. And we can see that question two had, had some influence there. Question six and seven are the questions or the factors that help us to determine the listening <laughs> profile. And here again, we can see that question six was the one that influenced in the number of errors that learners had in their essays, right? And questions eight, nine, and 10, the three of them, uh, we have negative correlations. So basically, the, those questions help us to define, to determine the historical profile. And we can see that with these negative correlations, these were the factors that most influenced in, in the performance, in, in the less errors that learners committed in, while, they, while they were writing 
their essays, right? So it means that attending a private school, particularly attending a private school, attending English classes, uh, basically that helps them to not commit as many errors as those learners who uh, didn't attend or attended a public institution or private English classes after, after their uh, outside of their high school hours, right? Do you have anything else to add here, Dr. Benjamin? Uh, no, I, I'll just add that going back, whoops, sorry, going back to uh, this table, uh, I think it is important to mention that these all are fairly low correlation. So even though some are more significant than others, as indicated by these asterisks, um, it's important to mention that really, uh, in terms of the total errors, mm, the correlations were, were low. Okay. And yeah, I think that's it. These are our references for uh, our study. And We've got, if uh, you guys are available, if you have some questions, we'd be happy to answer any of questions that you might have about our study. <coughs> Jesus. Do you have any questions, Lorena? This is, this is your opportunity to participate. <laughs> yeah. Hello, teachers. Good afternoon. Good well, afternoon. Actually, uh, actually, it's not a question. It's kind of um. Mm, well, I think it is very interesting to uh, see how uh, these factors are related to the um, manifestation of errors. Because yesterday, in uh, students were talking about how the fact that students are um, listening to music help them to right in a better way so i don't know um i was thinking about that so this yeah, is well, kind of, uh -huh. yes well i think but, it is kind of strange that listening helped them to write because uh, i don't know i was thinking about that uh, relationship i don't know <laughs> Yeah, Lorena, thank you, Lorena. Lorena is referring to the presentation that we gave yesterday to the fifth semester students in teacher in teacher Lolly's class. And one of the students asked this question. She asked, uh, what is the factor that most influenced in, in, in learners' performance? In other words, in learners not having so many errors. And based on that, uh, we modify the presentation for today and that's what we show at the end right because what by looking at the negative and positive correlations uh, it makes me a lot of noise that we obtain some positive correlations when we're expecting negative correlations in every single factor that means that the more students the more the participants are involved in doing some kind of activity the less errors they are going to commit. And a positive correlation is telling us the opposite. It's telling us that the more they, for example, they watch movies, the more errors they did, right? If the correlation is positive. So, but obviously we also have, we have several negative correlations. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Benjamin just mentioned this. The effect size of these correlations uh, are under a medium effect size, which means they are uh, 0 0.03, 0 0.05, 0 0.010. Uh, a small size is 0.10 and lower, according to the experts in, in, in this type of correlational indexes, right? Yeah, Lorena, we also thought about that, and we have meetings every day to reorganize and to rethink the, the information that we're presenting. Thank I, you think, for um, I, I think it's important also to mention that when doing a correlative study, we're not, um, it doesn't mean cause and effect. So we're only looking at associations. So it's possible that those students who are in the habit of listening to, let's say, radio or television online in English, 
that they have developed other habits as well that might positively influence their writing development. So I think one of the key takeaways for us and something that we talked about yesterday with the group was the importance of one skill having an effect on other skills, right? So maybe even reading, which wasn't our, our focus, but any type of receptive skill, reading or listening, how that can also positively influence um, productive skills like writing and speaking. And I think our results speak to that phenomena that, that it is really about the routines and how we as teachers can promote or should promote these routines <clears throat> where students get in the habit of listening uh, to uh, music, basically using the language in every opportunity that they that they have. Yep. So thank you, Lorena, for that question. Any other questions from anyone? I have a question. OK, go ahead. Uh, when a student made a mistake, uh, well, ever, <laughs> made an error, uh, having to do with prefixes and suffixes, uh, where do you place it? In the morphological, syntactical, or lexical? Again, please. Where do we place what? The Prefect. prefixes uh, uh, and suffixes? I mean, uh, an error that had to do with prefixes and suffixes. That's morphological because the morphology is about the form of words. Right, so even grammar books, for example, they, they have a complete section on subject-verb agreement, but uh, generally that's a morphological error, that's what it is. Uh, some grammarians, some, some grammar book authors, they, they make the topic more complex than, they explain the topic in a way that is more complex than it is, because it's just a morphological error. Uh, the inflection of the verb well, I, or the I, ending of the verb, like in simple present tense, just adding the S when we conjugate the verb with a, a third singular person, that's a morphological thing. But in grammar, they they see it as, or they oh. interpret it as, uh, as a subject-verb <laughs> agreement thing. Okay, well, I, I don't know why it comes to mind it had to do with lexical. Maybe I, I have a mistake there. At the beginning of our study, Adriana and everybody, uh, and, and you can see it, and you can see it in the name of our, of our research project, the way, the way it was approved, errores syntacticos y semanticos. That way, that's the idea that we have. And, and it's amazing to see that there are several studies published in different journals about uh, semantic and syntactic errors. And then when we presented our pre preliminary results last year in the 20th, uh, Cong 20th Congreso Nacional, in the 20th Seminary of Investigation in Postgrados, uh, we had three doctors evaluating us for the presentation. And at the end, one of the doctors pointed out that just like, just what Dr. Benjamin said today during the presentation, that almost any type of error can be considered a semantic error. And that's why we decided to classify the semantic errors that we had identified into, into morphological, lexical, and, 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 and syntactic error, right? Uh, it's all right. And re uh, regarding to the the results, uh, did yeah, the was uh, did I understand right that the more students uh, have uh, contact with uh, context, real contexts like uh, uh, the radio, like um, movies, uh, uh, the more they have contact with that, and the more they have contact. Uh, they they have classes English classes the less mistakes they make yep that's that's one of our results and that's what Lorena pointed out earlier that she finds uh, what the word she used she didn't say confusing she said I don't remember uh, that she we, we were not supposed to have this type of result because uh, how do you explain that how do you explain that 
the more you listen to the radio and watch TV, the less uh, writing errors you you commit, make, right? Right, and here- Maybe uh, to, it's uh, uh, go ahead. unconscious learning. Maybe, maybe, that, that will be my reasoning there. Uh, there's some implicit learning going on there, right? But we didn't want to talk about implicit learning here because that's that's not what our study is about. Right, just to your All point, right, Adriana. You. Yeah, uh -huh. so if you're looking, I don't know if you can see my screen, but just to clarify again, questions two, questions six, eight, nine, and 10, those are all um, negative correlations, which means that the more, for example, how often do you converse with friends? The more that they conversed with friends and family in English, the less mistakes they had. The more hours that they spent listening to the radio and television in English, the less errors that they had. Um, we did have a question on private and public schools, and there was a slight correlation uh, with those who went to the private school had fewer errors. And how many hours per week do you, how many weeks do you spend uh, taking classes in a private or public school, right? That also, uh, the more hours that they had per week, the less errors that they committed. So most of these questions were what we considered logical. There were some exceptions, question three and question seven, right? But what I think our, our final conclusion would be that, yes, it's more about looking at their routines, things that they uh, have done in the past, their histories with the language, their exposure to the language, to try to get a sense of what, they, what they've done in the past and then try to draw some uh, understanding to that with their errors that they committed, right? And so even though these were not strong correlations they were statistically significant and i think worth sharing and uh, again the takeaway being what kind of routines are students uh, practicing that really help them develop the language and not always thinking in terms of okay if i want to improve my writing skill i'm only going to focus on listening to podcasts for example on writing it's it's more, it's more open in the sense that it's just getting them to uh, interact with the language as much as possible. All right. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering why do I advise my students to better their writing? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Thank you. Well, thank you thank for the you. question. Any other uh, questions? I think Alejandrina and Lorena, they just uh, left the session. Okay. I'm here, teacher. I'm still oh, you're here. still here. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, if you allow me, I have a small question. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you uh, have a um, classification of errors that you uh, did based on several studies, right? But yep. do you have a code for uh words that are not necessary for example the opposite of missing word because uh i don't know i think that there is nothing like um, for example if someone says i don't know the lady woman is writing for example do you have a code for that uh unnecessary word maybe uh, I think off the top of my head, and Luis, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we would have labeled that just wrong word. Yeah, uh, can, you, can, you, can you show that slide where we have these uh, codes and, yeah. and examples? Let me share my screen again here. To see what we did, yeah, Lorena. It would be like the opposite of missing, but I don't know if it will be the same as wrong choice. We, if we're not able to give you an answer right now, Lorena, you can look at the Writing Academic English for edition at the end. There's a list of correction symbols, and you can also look at the book Introduction to Academic Writing, second edition, and there's a list of correction symbols also uh, at the end of the book. Here's the answer. Yeah. Wrong word is... Um, Wrong word, meaning is incorrect, or unnecessary words. 
So yeah, we, that's what we, we, uh, we lumped those two together. Ah, okay, okay. Although I would yeah. agree, I would agree that uh, they're not exactly the same. I would agree with you on that. But to be honest, uh, the number of the the wrong word error that we found, I would say most, if not all, were just using the wrong word uh, instead of maybe an unnecessary word or an extra word that was not necessary. We found very few examples, if any, of those types. But yep. yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, teacher. Thank, Thank you. you, teacher. Yeah, that's, Thank you, Lorena. That's a decision. That's a decision that we made, Lorena. We put together two types of errors under one specific code. As we, we want to, sorry. if you want to separate each type of error, then try to see how other authors have done it and other researchers, and then you can either go for one of them or come up with your own code. When we started with the analysis, we started with a code list that uh, we both used in class. And we used that as a starting point. As we got into it, we adapted the, the list. You know, for example, word choice is a perfect example where we just started with a general category of word form. But as we got into the analysis, we realized, well, there are a lot of different types of word form. So we felt the need to divide it up. Uh, and look at it individually. Even though after we did the analysis, there wasn't a whole lot to report, we did notice during the analysis that that was important to break it down. With the with the option of word uh, wrong word, we probably would have done the same had we found a lot of differences between or a lot of examples of unnecessary words versus just using the wrong word. Um, but uh, I think that was our rationale for keeping those under one category, but I, I, it was it was important I think to mention that you know we adapted these these codes. They weren't all predetermined codes. M many of the codes we used were predetermined based on the literature, but we also some cur uh, codes emerged or or errors emerged uh, the way that we coded the errors as we got into the analysis. Yeah. I also want to say that uh, Lorena is is doing her PhD, and she is investigating something very similar to what we just presented today. Yeah, and I want to uh, encourage all teachers in the BA to to um, to consider action research, like really looking at your own practice and sharing your own practice. Um, with with other teachers in the form of action research so that we can continue to collaborate and learn from each other as far as what kind of uh, problems that we're addressing. And I think action research, doing that type of research is uh, very important, um, especially now that we're really doing a lot of new things with technology and trying to adapt with online classes. Um, but uh, we do want to thank you for those who are attending. We have recorded this session. We're going to make it available to anyone who wants to uh, have access to this information. But we found that we wanted to formally present our research as we're concluding our two-year project and um, want to uh, wanted again to share these results. And if anyone has any questions or wants to learn more about the study or learn, learn more about the specifics to the study, feel free to reach out to either one of us be uh, happy to uh, talk to you more in depth about what we did. All right. Thank you very much, Adriana, Lorena, Lolis, Alejandrina just left the, uh, the session, but I thank her in the chat. Thank you. It's right. really interesting. Take care, and hopefully someday we'll, be, we'll see you back in the classroom. Someday. Someday. Yeah. someday. Someday.